Hi, everybody. Welcome along to episode 37 of Percussion Discussion. Um, hope you're all well and uh, enjoying the interviews. Uh, please check out our social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, our YouTube channel. If you would give us a subscribe, that would be amazing. This way, it means you won't miss any of the interviews that we've got coming up and any that we've already done. Um, and the great news is you can also find um, the interviews in podcast form. Uh, and they are on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So if you search for North Wales Drum Promotions, you'll be able to find those as well. On to today's guest, uh, an incredible drummer. If you uh, happen to listen to the radio in the 1990s, you would have probably heard more of this gentleman's drumming than you would anybody else. Um, prolific is the word, originally from Allenstown in the US, uh, moved over to the UK in sort of early to mid 80s he's been here ever since and he has played on so many hit albums and singles you wouldn't believe it gives me great pleasure to welcome mr chuck sabo oh my pleasure my pleasure thank, thank you. you it's great it's great, to, it's great to see you now obviously as i always start the interviews at this point and, and i must sound like a stuck record now but we are in strange very unusual times for anybody involved in music or the arts it's it's kind of we're like a luxury item at the moment um so have you have you managed to keep busy through through lockdown and through this pandemic well yes i am very very pleased to say yeah completely busy um because uh, a little while back, um, maybe a couple of years back, when, you know, session, sessions change, you know, and the people that hire you move, move to different positions or retire or things like that. So, so again, we were talking about you have to adapt a little earlier. Again, you have to adapt. So, um on came the online sessions. So I, I jumped into that. I like engineering and mixing and doing all that kind of thing as well. So I already, I've always had a studio. So I, I adapted to that really quickly. Um, and, and that's the thing that kept going because mm. not just me, obviously, uh, was in lockdown, but but everyone, all the musicians were in lockdown. They, you want to write, you want to record, you want to get things done. So, yeah, songs kept coming. Uh, and it's, it's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible. Um, I'm just fortunate that I have a studio. Yeah. Just, you know, there's my house. Here's the studio. So, sure. you know, uh, yeah, very fortunate. Uh, but very busy. Thank you. So have you, have, have you actually noticed the difference in work? I mean, has it, has it stayed the same for you? Obviously, there's been no live stuff for anybody, but studio-wise, you've just kept, I guess you've just, just carried on as normal. You know, if anything, if anything, it got a little busier. Right. Okay, because, because everyone's in lockdown, so uh, everyone else wanted to be busy. So, yeah, if anything, it was a little busier. Hmm. Oh, well, so, so you were you were already um, un, un, unawares, of course, but you 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 were already perfectly ready for a for a lockdown and, and a pandemic. You, I guess you've been doing this for a few years in your own in your own place, and and people send you stems and all that kind of thing. I guess you do a lot of that these days, and you just play on. I do, I do. Um, it's it's now it's a whole big thing now. It's you know drummers. Musicians call themselves online session players. Mm. It's instead of just session players. Um, it's a whole, it's a whole nother realm. It's, um, I, nothing beats going into the studio mm. with a great producer, a great bunch of players, and sit down. I've listened to the song and get into creating and and uh, feedback and and. Uh, that's a great, that's a great time. It's a great day, but it's a whole different thing when you, all of a sudden you're by yourself, you sent a song and you have, you have to be the producer, the engineer and the, and the drummer. Um, so it's a whole, it, it is a whole other art form, mm. which again, I take, I, I took to like a, like a, a fish 
in water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and um, and now, you know, I have my own website where people get in touch with me for this. Um, there are also websites out there for people that join up hmm. and and people looking for drum tracks, guitar tracks, whatever, will go to, the, to these sites to find them. Um, but it's it, nothing. Will, nothing will replace going out to the studio. Yeah. But well, um, it's 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 still very cool. You still get to you still get to play, um, and record and you know awesome. talk to people. But more of this kind of talking, like <laughs> <laughs> than anything. Um, in in fact, that's the worst part of it all is the file sending and the waiting and, and, and that, and that sort of thing, uh, which is all improving through different apps and whatnot. But yes, I, I do enjoy it, but I do miss, you know, being in a studio with, with the lads. Sure. Can, can, can I, obviously that's a, you know, that's, that's a no brainer that you miss, you miss the company of other, other musicians, don't you? You know, engineers, whoever you've got there, but yeah. do you find you're there on your own? Um, are you, are you more self-critical when you're, when there's no producer there to say, Oh, maybe try it like this. You, do, do you have to be, or, or are you just quite comfortable and you go, Oh, well, it'll be, it's, it's fine. They'll send it back if it's not quite what they want or, you know, are you, are you, do you find that's a thing? I don't know. It is actually easier to sit down and um, and put down your put down your drums with a producer in, in the control room. It's a lot easier because right away you do the take and and you're told if that's what they're looking for or if there should be a little change. But uh, without without that person there, you have immediately. What you have to think is this what they would want, um, and so. But through doing it now for a while, um, I kind of know the questions to ask up front about, you know, do you want it just like it's programmed at the minute, or do you want freedom? You know, how, what would you like me to do? So I basically do just do three takes. Sure. And then I, I, I listen to the takes and I put the best of the three together for me and send that off. Um, and that usually works. Sure. Sometimes sure. There's, they'll, they'll come back and they'll need, you know, they'll, they'll want a little change. Uh, but I haven't found it any longer to be uh, an annoying part of the job. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, because some people really get get into themselves, like, oh my God, is that is that right, or is, would would they like it this way? I know, I know some great musicians that just can't make a decision, you know. <laughs> so it's I, I, I personally I like to be directed. I like to be told this is what you'll do, and this is how it's going to sound. And I'm sure a lot of people don't but I feel comfortable in that situation. I like to be told this is how it's going to go. And, and then, I'm, okay, that's fine. I don't know if, you know. Oh yeah. I, you know, that it's great because really your job is simpler mm. in that setting. By, absolutely simpler. Um, so ha have you ever done any online stuff? Um, not, not anything of note, just, just, um, Nothing professionally, no. Uh, I don't really have the facility to do to do it well, so no, no, definitely not. <laughs> okay, it just takes doing it once to realize what, how much more is needed than just laying down a good track. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I suppose you need the sounds need to be good at source for start. You know, it's it's it's, it's a lot. It's not just playing drums, is it anymore at that point? It really isn't. Mm. It really is. Uh, but everything, everything I've done before is is helping the online work. Mm. You know, just 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 seeing what engineers do, how they mic up, what equipment's used, and things like that. You know what to you know what to get. You know how to use it. Um, and just like with laying down 
drum tracks in the studio, uh, it, it comes with pride. You know, you, you deliver, you want to be good. You want it to be good. Uh, the problem is that now everybody and their dogs are doing online sessions. So what they have to do to try and get the work is do a drum track for 50 bucks. Mm. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. Um, how can you make a living doing that? Uh, you know, maybe if, you, if you're in your parents' basement and... It's pocket still, money, isn't it? It's pocket money. That's all that it, is. It's, yeah, so, so, you know, there's a little bit of, of pool there from, from the people trying to under undercharge and do it really cheaply. But basically, you know, I've discovered you just stick to your guns. You, you give, you do quality work, yet quality sounds. And, and what, what, what happens is you get the quality songs in. Yeah. You don't get files that are all messed up and, 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 uh, and, and it's a lot more enjoyable. And um, some great, great stuff has been coming in, you know. Mm. So, uh, so I, yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. And and the good thing is, well, uh, doing it this way, you're not limited to British artists or whatever. You, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. You could have musicians every corner of the world, and it's still, still going to be the good, isn't it? You know, it's still, it's still accessible. It's, you know, that's it. I mean, you're, you're uh, the. the field has opened up to the world now so it's not just you know who who's gonna being a being a a lister of london you can now people are from all over the world so it's it's turned out to be um very lucrative Mm, that's good that's good to hear so look, let's let's go back a, a, a little way to to where where music all began for you chuck where Talk us through it. Where, where did, what's the first thing you remember about music and being interested in it? Okay. Um, really, it's, yeah, it was about, um, about the age of seven or something like that. And I, and a neighbor, my, my, my friend, uh, who's also a neighbor, his drummer, his brother was a, a drummer in this band and they were playing outside for some reason. And, and he, he said, come on, let me sit on, on this drum kit. I had to play, and that was it. I ran home, told mom, I'm going to be a drummer. <laughs> That's it. I'm going to be a drummer. How was that, Matt? <laughs> well, it, it was actually favorably, um, but with, you know, with um, rules. As in, okay, so first what we'll do is get you a pad and some sticks and drum lessons. Mm -hmm. If you stick with that for a year, you'll get the snare drum. If you stick with that for a year, you'll get the drum kit. You know, so it built like that, which nowadays I have to say, because I did some teaching and nobody wants to start with the pad or the snare. No. <laughs> nobody wants to do that at all anymore. Um, but I, I stuck with it. And, and from, from that time, sitting on the stool of my best mate's brother, it, I never changed or faltered mm. an idea of what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. Um, to my detriment, actually, because... I was so convinced I was going to be a drummer, a famous drummer, that I skipped school. I don't need school. Spelling, I don't need to spell. <laughs> Math, who needs that? It was in counter <laughs> four. <laughs> I can count to four, I can spell it, and I can play drums. <laughs> oh, not really. But, um, yeah, so, so that was that. And then um, Allentown, Pennsylvania had lots of bands playing, but it's all cover bands. Mm-hmm. Allentown is like an hour from New York City, 
an hour west of New York City, an hour east of Philadelphia. So, of course, as I grew up, I decided I need to move to a, to a larger city to pursue this. So I moved to, to New York, um, I think I was 20, I was 20, um, and started playing in, I think at one point I was in six different bands, you know, just answering uh, ads in the Village Voice and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but to, in order to subsidize that, I had to move furniture. Mm -hmm. So move the furniture in the day, and then a few rehearsals at night with the different band, with the different bands, um, until until they started um, making a little money. Um, but what what naturally happened was none of the bands took off or got signed or became huge. But people would start to call me to record something for them or they, or a band that did have a deal would hear about this drummer. And so with that, I got pulled into the session market. Sure. Um, so my dream of being, you know, like in a famous band uh, was, was going, but the drummer part was obviously still there. Sure. Um, so yeah, so I, I, so I built it up. You know, you just, it's a natural thing through the grapevine. Your name gets around, you do your job well, and, and you get more calls, better calls, better gigs. Um, eventually did an album for a band called Comatines, a New York band. Yeah. And they took me on a tour to England and France. Um, I believe that was around 80, 1984, 85. And at the time, New York was pretty rough. Mm. I was living in East Greenwich Village, a second between A and B, called Alphabet City. The building next to me was burnt out, and then another building next to that was burnt out, and so on. Um, and when I, so when I got to London, I thought, oh my God, this place. And in 84, 85, almost half the bands in America, the American charts were British. So they were really churning it out here. And the place was so safe, London. And they had cushion on the seats on the underground. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't have to turn your rings around or take them off. You know, it was like, yeah. I thought, wow. Plus, I love I love the look of it. You know, some, it's like I'd been there before or something. Just really took to it. Uh, so, so we did the tour, and and then after the tour, I stayed and um, I auditioned for a couple bands, and I got the job. I got a job with two bands. One was managed by Miles Copeland. And another by the guy who was managing Flock of Seagulls at the time. So I accepted the job that Miles was uh, managing, and but that was in Glasgow, in Scotland. Oh. At that time, I, I I thought you'd even need a passport to get from England to Scotland. Long <laughs> <laughs> ago, and how young I was. Um, so I went home for Christmas, got myself packed up. Um, stuck it on the boat and then I flew over and, um, and I stayed with talking the band was called Talking Drums in Glasgow but being in Glasgow after New York City was extreme especially at that time again like 84-85 there were only four channels on TV over <laughs> here <laughs> and they would all shut off at 12 and the pubs would close at 11. So, and I was used to getting ready to go out at one in the morning. 
<laughs> so you can imagine culture shock. Crazy. I think they call it. No. Yeah, culture shock. Um, in fact, it was because it was winter. It was just after Christmas. Um, the guys put had me stay in their house, and they they put me in a room. And every time I opened the curtain, it was dark. It was dark out. So it turns out I was in the room for three days. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway so I come out and uh, yeah it was it was a real culture shock I was just wandering the streets at like one in the morning looking for something um, soon I didn't really get used to that but um, but soon I changed my decision from working with uh, talking drums to working with the London band that was managed by Mick Rossi, Fox Eagles guy. Yeah. And, and then I carried on working with the Glaswegians on just when they needed me on weekends and whatnot. Yeah. So that was feeling a little bit better. I'm in London. And of course that, that was a better place as well, even at that time to get your name around. And um, long story short, which is already past that, but, Oh, uh, <laughs> the name <clears throat> just, you know, circulated got through the grapevine and the jobs got better. Um, I did miss something out. When we did the Comatines tour, on the, when I first came over, um, we met Etienne Dajo, who is a major... French star. So I ended up doing uh, his tour and his album around that time, 85, 86, around there. Um, so I was already seemed to be in a better place. You know, things were happening um, at a decent pace. Um, and then uh, yeah, and then it just picked up from there, at meeting meeting uh, the right people, doing the right sessions. I will allow you to answer, ask a question now. <laughs> well, hey, it's, it's all flowing along nicely, to be honest. I mean, you know, there's, there's sort of late 80s through the 90s. You were never off the radio with, with the tracks you were playing. You must have been. Were you predominantly... Um, a studio player, would, would you say? I mean, I don't want to put you in a box, perhaps, but the recordings you played on, it was prolific, wasn't it? It really was. Um, yes, I was. I definitely was more of a studio player than a live player. Hmm. There was one, um, a great time, a great memory for me when I was do, with Shakespeare's sister. Hmm. And... So I recorded the Right Said Fred album uh, with, with I'm Too Sexy and Deeply Dippy On. And, um, and then um, on tour with Shakespeare's sister. And we were on top of the pops for eight weeks in a row. And then on the ninth week, I had to leave rehearsal. I said, I'm sorry, I have to leave rehearsal. I'm still on top of the pops this week <laughs> because Deeply Dippy was number one then. <laughs> uh, do you know what? If you, if you don't mind, Chuck, right? It, it's one of those, um, right said Fred, one of those bands, it, 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 I've secretly always thought, do you know what? I like that. It's totally different to anything else I've ever heard. And it's kind of a pleasant sound, isn't it? It's not. It's not. It's not offensive. It's just. Just talk us through that, that album. It's. It's. What do they call it? I think it's called a guilty pleasure, isn't it? That's what they call it. So there you go. It's yeah. out. Everyone knows. Right said Fred, is my guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's it the hair. A, we had a lot of pleasure at, from Right said Fred. I have to say, um, it was a great combination. The producer, um, Tommy. Tommy, God, his, his second name just left me. It'll come back. Hmm. Um, it was, he was a DJ. So it was just a really good combination at the time. Um, 
he had great ideas for that for that very moment in time. And um, yeah, I mean, songs like, like "I'm Too Sexy" is just <laughs> it's not just fun, you know. It's just it's fun. doing the videos was just fun. It was all just fun. Um, Deeply Dippy was actually, you know, actually had some horns and 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 uh, a little bit of a nice arrangement to it. Uh, all live playing, you know, which is really cool as well. Um, the, the the lads were great, really. So there wasn't anything bad about that at all. Mm, mm. Um, oh God, I wish I wish that name Tommy D. Tommy D. Um, so the problem is there was a, a little issue with with Tommy and the band for the next album, and 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 he didn't follow on. So you know. That was the album. Yeah. That but, first album. That was it's a good, album. fun album. And do you know what? The production on it is, I can describe it as a lovely, warm sounding album. That it's just, and I think that's partly due to the voices, just the, the depth of the voices, you know, it just, it just works. It's fun. And it was all over the radio, wasn't it? it for, for such a long time. It was huge. Yeah. Um, it was done at Red Bus Studios, which is, um, it, it, it's a bit of a classic place <clears throat> and of course it was the days of still tape so nice and warm nice and warm sounds um, and it was it was absolutely radio friendly it was just <laughs> you know some things just happened at the right time in the right sound and, and that was one of them yeah. it did just it, 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 it didn't miss it didn't miss one little Crick, you know where it could land. Um, so yeah, hearing it on the radio made you smile, you know. Absolutely. Do you know what it was? I remember, um, and it came back to me this thought this morning. I, I remember once just laughing to myself. I looked through my. I, I don't really have much of a CD collection any, anymore, but when I did, I remember seeing it sitting next to the Chick Career acoustic band CD. <laughs> right, said Fred, and I was thinking, oh, I hope nobody ever sees this. <laughs> but you know, hey, you can't knock it. The, the, you know, it's it's there. It's it's part of history, isn't it? And um, the case of of um, you know the grapevine. I'm, I'm asked I'm asked frequently from young players about you know getting work and whatnot, and there is no shortcut. The grapevine, um, and I was working at Red Bus with Martin Ware from Heaven 17. No, from, oh my God, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, but uh, Human League. Oh, yeah, yeah. God. <laughs> and um, so we were doing an album called British Electric Foundation. And Tina Turner did a track. Billy Preston did a track. Terence Trent D'Arby did a track. Um, Shaka Khan did a track. Um, Green from Squiddy Politti did a track. So it was just bang, 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 bang. That didn't hurt the CV no. at all. See, it was like a house band with all the different vocalists, yeah? Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, and Martin was with seeing the manager of Right Said Fred. Mm. So there you go. So she was there hearing hearing the band and whatnot. And it, it was it was basically that band yeah. that went on to do Right Said Fred, except for the players in Right Said Fred. So did you find at this point it, it was literally one gig to the, another, you know, one, one had finished or, or something, I don't want to say better would come along, something different would come along that, that you thought, yeah, like, I mean, for example, Natalie Imbruglia was like the sweetheart of the 90s, wasn't she? She was huge, you know. Did, was, that how, was that after Right Said Fred? It was. Because you, yeah. you if I'm right, you did all, everything she's ever done, you've done. 
I much. did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I was her musical director on tour. Sure. Um, so that was. Uh, let's see how that, that happened. Mark Fox. That's where I was at Heaven 17. That's Mark Fox. Right. Um, the percussionist from, from there. He was a and guy at mm-hmm. RCA that signed her. So he called me in to, you know, discuss putting a band together for this. Uh, Bill Alley produced it. And he actually co-wrote Torn. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was, uh, yeah, that that was just one of those things you, you, you can't predict how great that's going to turn out. You know, when you're, when you're in there and when you meet the people and you're recording torn and it's just, you know, it's just another great session, but you look back at it a year later and you're like, wow, you know, I'm glad I did a good job on that. <laughs> it's a great song. It's got a great groove as well, hasn't it? You know, you can't, you can't, not tap your foot along. I've, pl- I've probably played along in here to your drum parts on that. So it, it's just, and it still stands up now as a great song. You know, um, it doesn't sound dated at all, I don't think. Um, oh, I, I agree. I agree. But that was, a, that was just a great time. Like, like you said, it was almost, yeah, one session to the next, you know, be, one call from the next and um you, you just it's it's like it's like you just want to stop time for a bit for a bit because it's like you know this this is really amazing you know you, let me take this in <laughs> but you don't till later um i enjoyed it thoroughly uh I, you know I, as you know from, from earlier, I said, you know, I always knew what I was going to do, but I never realized that it would turn into something so amazing and you, the phone would ring and, of, of course, let the machine get it. And it those say, let the machine. Um, Brian Eno. Brian Eno's on the phone. I'm like, come on. This is, um, this is, just, this is too cool. Um, Brian Adams is on the phone. <laughs> Loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, so, I, and I still do. Oh yeah, I miss those studio days, though. Oh, it. I mean, you. you I mean, your um, your recordings. Is, I mean, I've written a few names down. I mean, Marcella Detroit. That was some great stuff you did with her. Uh, I mean, take that. Even at their peak, you were recording stuff for them. Um, I mean, I've got. Um, is it Babe you played on? Babe and, and Love Ain't Here Anymore. Yeah, yeah, great. And and again, radio friendly. There mustn't have been a day you didn't hear at least five tracks. You must have felt like Hal Blaine in the 90s, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Pretty cool. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, oh. Happy days. It's yeah. just, just phenomenal. Um, Heather Small, Elton John... The, it just go, it go. I mean, and there's some artists as well. I, I know you've recorded who who I'm not aware of. I don't, you know, I, I don't don't know everybody. But it, you seem to have had. Did you find there was a time when it's like anything? People eventually will move on or perhaps forget about you. Was did that ever happen, or have you ever? Have you just continued solidly and just kept going and going? Uh, if, you know, it seems it seems like it's solid. Um, and when you look back, it, it's it's quite solid. But uh, self-employment session work, it's it's peaks and valleys. Hmm. So some you know sometimes it does run from one job to the next, but more than not, there's 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 these breaks. You know, there's sometimes there's these breaks where you you're checking your phone, like. And thinking, what did, did I did I piss somebody off? But <laughs> and, and then and then bang, the peak comes again, and yeah. you're going again. Uh, so yeah, you have to get used to the peaks and valleys, not just mentally but financially. Yeah, you know you can't think 
this is it. This is the way it's going to be forever. Uh, as a session player, you're self-employed, and and it it just works that way. Um, it's precarious, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Hmm. But it's just part. It's just part of it, and and the you know the sooner you you come to terms with that in both ways, financially and and otherwise the better off you are because you're planning for it. You're not thinking it will never stop. You know, it's going to rest and then come and rest. So, um, but uh, then during the rest, you, you use it creatively, you know? Yeah. So sure. um, I, I would, I'm a songwriter as well. Um, and I, and I was signed to BMG music. For public for, for publishing, so I use the breaks for writing um, and producing as well. I, I I would find something I like, the young band or singer, and do some production, um, and that's and that's how it the, the flow carries on that way. Yeah, and and tell me, how did you uh, did you enjoy? being a musical director as well i mean there's there's obviously added pressure there you know all of a sudden you're not just worrying about yourself you're you've got i don't know over many musicians on the stage would you would you fix the band as well chuck i did mm. <clears throat> um they the only change was was the second one of the, one of the guitarists that i chose natalie chose someone different <clears throat> but on every t- on on all the tours I've done, I, yeah, I fix the band, and you know that makes it easier because I know the people I'm working with. We've we've done lots of stuff before, so <clears throat> there's a feel <clears throat> the band already feels tight. Yeah. Uh, you can't pay for that. That's no. great. Yeah, of course. And and your friends, so it's it's <clears throat> very easy traveling the tour bus. Uh, uh, the hotels, all that becomes easier because you know the people you've chosen are going to be sure uh, cool to hang out with. So was was was, was Natalie and Brulia? Was she? I mean, obviously, I know how huge she was in the UK. Was that? A, was that? Was was it? Was it a worldwide thing or a European thing? I mean, I don't know how far her her fame had spread at this point. How big was she in in the grand scheme of things? Well, I think. Um, Torn was number four in America. Wow. And probably around the top, if not number one, certainly close in Australia. Mm. Well, yeah. Um, so we did, we did tour and TVs through the States and a lot in Australia, um, Japan. And, um, yeah, a few other territories, but we didn't follow it around as much as we could have. And the first album was was her best seller, and the label was really pushing to get her to tour on that album. Yeah. But because she only had that group of songs, and it was her first album, she really wasn't keen to to yeah. do loads and loads of shows. So, um, unfortunately, we didn't. Uh, the second album, it was in, you know, enough songs for a better show in, uh, as far as what she was thinking. Um, but because they didn't do as well, the label wasn't pushing as much, yeah. you know, for us to show. So, you, you know, it's it runs hot and cold just like that. Catch, catch twenty two, <laughs> as they say. Yeah, yeah. That's. Um, I, I mean, you'd think the temptation would be to go and push push the hit album as much as you can, even if it means filling with cover versions or whatever, just to get enough songs for the set, wouldn't you? I know plenty oh, of others, yeah. plenty of others have done it. We were very keen, yeah. <laughs> the best, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, one of those that, things. that was that. 
Um, but uh, we worked together for nine years. That's a long time. Mm. Yeah, so... I mean, what... She was great. Oh, was what, what... I mean, I'm always fascinated. I know a, a few drummers... Um, that do MD work. Andrew Small is one I've spoken to. There's, there's plenty of them. What role uh, does the drummer take as MD? Are you in charge of arrangements? Of, of um, I don't know. Do you write parts? How, well, how far does it go for the for a drummer as MD? Well, um, you liaise closely with the artist uh, to, to see what um, how, how they want to play it, and then. Um, and you just make sure everyone's playing their parts correctly. You, you cut it down to acoustic versions. Um, you check the BVs on their own, you know, just basically just what you would do production wise. Yeah. Um, and then you, you short list about six songs that cover every instrument for a set list, uh, for a um, sound check set. Sure. Um, you know, make, make sure people are on time and not too hungover. Uh, <laughs> you, you get, you're getting into tour manager realm here as well. It, it covers the whole, yeah. Yes. Just um, make it as easy for the artist as, as possible, really. Sure. And, um, and sound as good as you can. Were you, uh, back in the 90s, were, were you using clicks or was it just a few electronics and bits and pieces or was it all live? We did the uh, very first tour, was all live. And then as, as we went, we started adding bits and pieces of, of the album. Sure. Um, the more we toured, the more we added. Yeah, yeah. I hear that a and, lot. And it was, yeah, it, it was kind of, what people were doing as well, mm. uh, trying to sound as full as the album. Yeah. When you go to see it. Or keeping the same size band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep the budget down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now it's, it's fascinating because, you know, we, as, as drummers, as music fans, we go to these shows and it's always nice to know what's involved from the other side. Obviously, everyone can hear everyone playing, but as far as, you know, things like things like that, I, I always find it's fascinating to know. Uh, it might be run of the mill to yourself who, who's done it and, and does it regularly, but to everyone else, I always think it's nice just to hear a little bit about it. To know about, oh, what, how, what's happening on yeah, stage? The, sound yeah, yeah, absolutely. I find, I find it interesting. Maybe I'm the only one, I don't know, but I, hopefully not. <laughs> Well, I, don't, I, d I doubt that you are. Um, and then, you know, then, then there's uh, little struggles between yourself or the band and the sound guy and the artist. And when it comes to uh, the stage volumes yeah. and, and, then, and wanting to encase the kit in the, you know, all this stuff kind of started happening. Yeah. It was never, they were never there before, you know, Led Zeppelin and whatnot. <laughs> and, uh, Chili Peppers, you know, you didn't see little plastic bits behind the kit. <laughs> oh, well, do you know, just to put this, just to put this into comparison, um, I had a lovely chat with Simon Kirk, obviously free and bad company. And I asked about the Isle of Wight Festival in 1970 to 600,000 people. He said, oh, it was amazing. He said, there was no monitors. <laughs> we just angled the amps in a little bit. Can you imagine somebody today going on a, a Glastonbury? Oh, sorry, there's no wedges or in ears. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> no, no. Well, everyone's far used to too much now. It's Spoiled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Oh, dear me. Well, I, I am glad that I, I um, wasn't just a studio drummer because... Playing shows like that, playing Glastonbury, which we headlined with Shakespeare's sister. Right, okay. And oh, it, it's incredible. And, and places like that in Hyde Park, is when you hit your, your bass drum and you know <laughs> all the way back there, they're feeling it in there. It's just, it's just every, 
it's just a smile. It just makes you want to dig in. (laughs) Yeah, you know, not a nerve about it. Um, in, in fact, before we did this, the, uh, the set at Glastonbury with Shakespeare's sister, I had kind of, you know, zenned myself by that point into slowing down time on stage because all the rest of it is travel, waiting, uh, rehearsal, waiting, travel, and then you get on stage and you're so excited or possible or nervous. It goes like that and you're off stage and you're back in the bus again. So I, I made myself slow down time so that, it, so that the minutes on stage would last longer. Yeah. I understand that. So I passed this on to the band. I said, listen, this is, we're head, this is Glastonbury. We're headlining. It's, it's, this is amazing. When you're up there, just stop for a bit and look at pe- look at people, look at the audience, see what's happening, feel it. You just make it slow down a bit. And they all came off stage. Not all of them. Most came off stage going, "That was amazing." Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there must, there must, must be incredible memories for you, Chuck. You know. Um... Oh, obviously, in a time when there's no gigs happening at the moment, something like that must be like a pipe dream. Um, you know, pl- yeah. Playing anyway, <laughs> it's a pipe dream. Did that happen? Did that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get there again, and, and you know. But hey, look, you've been there. You've been a massive part of it. You still are. Obviously, you're still a busy, uh, you know, busy with the studio and stuff. I mean, do you do you intend to get out? Do, do you do much gigging at the moment, or is it you? you know mainly studio stuff studio um the only live gigging i do now is with um neil taylor uh session guitarist um and and he has a bit of an audience in austria okay so sometimes we just pop over there and, and do some shows um other than that, no, no, I'm just here in my in my nice my little cave, um, <laughs> my little home of love. <laughs> well, you know, it's keeping you going. You you seem very happy in there, I have to say. So, um, you know, l- long may it continue. Look, Chuck, thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure chatting for I don't know how long we've been talking for forty five minutes or something like that. And, um, you know, we don't, in the 90s, your name was everywhere. And, and, and like things do, things drop off and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't know that name. And um, as soon as I heard your name, I was like, yes, please. I want to, I wanna, let's have a chat, you know, because uh, so it's nice for people to see that you're still out there, still doing. Uh, you've got your website. If you feel free to give your web, uh, website address out, by the way, Chuck, as well, so people can check out what you're doing. ChuckSabo.com. Nice and easy. <laughs> Chuck, thank you for your time. It's appreciated. Maddie, it's a pleasure. And, and it, I, I appreciate the likes of yourself doing things like this. Um, yeah, I, I, it's great. It's great. Thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate it. So thank you very much. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Maddie. Bye-bye.